probably going to be the most technical session of this conference. And I'm going to try to walk a fine line between getting into the technical details of tag PDF and how it came to be, uh, while trying to keep it applicable to people who are using this in the real world and are writing the software to produce it. Um, the talk's broken into three sections. A little bit about the history of tag PDF and the problems it was trying to solve. A little bit around the creation process and the sort of things you need to think about. There's no specific tools that I'll mention here today. I'm not talking about software or products, just techniques. And then a bit about the future and applying tagging and, and, and where's it, where it's going. So, a little bit about the history of accessible PDF. So, when PDF was first introduced in 1993, it was trying to solve a very specific problem. It was all about um, final form layout. It was adapting the PostScript rendering model and trying to make it more applicable to screens and to distribution. Um, it's based on the idea that you're painting things to a canvas, that canvas has a fixed size, and you want those things to be painted in the correct location with the right color and the, the correct properties. And so you paint things like text, paths, images, and that's how you produce PDF content. Um, it was aimed at perfect um, dis uh, perfect reproduction of print documents. So the idea was that if I sent it to you, you could receive it on any piece of software and get the same result. It was entirely focused on visualization and nothing to do with things like accessibility. Um, appearance was everything. Well, on the right there, I have a little example of just the, the concept of a content stream. I don't expect anyone to care what this actually says. But when you're rendering, you're just really saying, put these things in this position and, and show them like this. Um, PDF was introduced because there were limitations in the PostScript model. Um, Adobe was looking for encapsulation of documents, something that could contain everything needed to have consistent reproduction on any platform. And so um, PostScript didn't necessarily have that. This was a way to build an object structure around these documents and to convey that information for interchange. Um, it was optimized. One of the limitations with PostScript was to print page 101. You had to have rested all the pages <coughs> up to 100 before you got to 101. It was just the idea that you build this graphic stack and you say show page, show page, show page, and once you've got to the 101st show page, you're ready to page 101. PDF got rid of that concept and gave you random access. It put in the model of you can go straight to page 101 without having to care anything about the first 100 pages of the document. Um, PostScript was also a full Turing complete programming language. Um, that was very hard to process in 1993 in real time on a computer screen particularly if you had a multi-page document. It was designed for fast rasterization. So PDF was a simplification of PostScript with encapsulation of all the assets, whether it's images, fonts, other things that were needed to display that document. Um, but since 1993, the needs for PDF have changed significantly. And that's where things like PDF UA and Tag PDF come into play and how PDF can be an accessible format. Um, Things like content extraction, I think this was mentioned earlier, so data analysis, access to the content was required. And that wasn't something that was fundamentally uh, available in PDF when it was first released. Accessibility requires an understanding of content to accurately convey the meaning of behind the content, whether this is a paragraph or a heading. Um, search, indexing, um, and PDF UA basically is entirely uh, composed around the concept of tag PDF. PDF UA, PDF UA goes beyond tag PDF, but tag PDF is most of what PDF UA talks about. And that's why I wanted to focus on, on tag PDF in this talk. So let me just show a few examples of some of the challenges that face people processing PDF that's not tagged, or some of the things that tag PDF tries to solve. When I'm drawing some text, as long as the final appearance is correct, it doesn't matter what order that content's rested in. So just to do that again, you can see here that I'm basically putting all the consonants down and then the vowel second. It's a bit silly, no one would do this hopefully. I, I did it there based on color. There's some coloring in there, so all of one color was rested before the second color. That's a perfectly legitimate way to lay out a content stream, but it would make it highly inaccessible. Um, a common problem with printers in the past was that they had to be they had to print downwards. They didn't really want to come back up because of uh, alignment issues. So it's very common when representing two columns <coughs> in a document to have those two columns rendered 
left, right, left, right, left, right, rather than one column followed by the second column. If you imagine trying to read that to a person, how does a processor know that there are two columns in that document? Um, fonts. It's very common to put all the content in one font now before you put the content in a second font. Um, in this case, how do you know uh, what content is? Um, if I want to read aloud that top right piece of content, were spaces included in the content stream? Could I actually disambiguate words? Um, in the content below, what language is the content in? How, how do I guess at that? Um, and what constitutes a paragraph? Is it the spacing around it? Is it the way it's structured? If I'm just rastering stuff to a canvas, I have no concept of whether these things are um, you know, units of content or, or what they represent. Um, how do I tell the difference between headings? Do I know that this font is a heading? It, you can use heuristics and complex programming to try to guess at a lot of these things, but the reality is that it's non-deterministic unless you put information in to, to solve that problem. Um, in this case, uh, I just highlighted <coughs> the fact that there's different fonts used just to convey the headings plus the size changes. Um, also, when you think of more complex structures than paragraphs and headings, when you start to think about tables and lists, um, in what order are the graphics actually drawn? So you can do a list, for example, a line at a time. You can also do it, um, the bullets first, followed by the text. Both of those produce the exact same visual appearance, but would make it easier or harder to represent that to a user. Uh, if I draw a table, well, a table in PDF is just comprised of a set of lines, maybe. Um, and then inside those lines, I start to place content. Um, the things at the top happen to be headings, but how do I know? The order doesn't tell me anything. So, so what I wanted to highlight with this is the fact that, fundamentally, when you get down to content, PDF isn't trying to convey anything about the order and the semantics of that content at its, at its heart. It's trying to get it to appear in a certain way on a sheet of paper. So, how do we solve this problem? How do we, how do we get from where we were to where we are today? And how do we solve these fundamental issues? Um, so Tech PDF is based on a couple of techniques that came before it. In PDF 1.2, uh, the concept of marked content was introduced to PDF. And the idea behind marked content was that you can basically take a content stream, one of these things that draws a page, and you can demarcate sequences within that content and label them. The original intent behind Mark Content had nothing whatsoever to do with semantics or uh, accessibility. It was actually so that um, uh, Creators of PDF can put private metadata into the content streams and annotate those content streams in a way that they could then reuse in future processing. So it was just there to allow people who wanted to annotate their content streams with extra rich information uh, to do that. It has no impact on the rendering of the content, it's just a way of annotating those streams. But at its heart, this is what defines tag PDF. The second thing was the concept of a logical structure. Um, the concept of logical structure is that you have a tree that represents the, the, the content of the document and the order is basically defined by traversing that tree and items in the tree have semantic meaning. In PDF 1.3, the generic concept of logical structure was introduced. At this point, there was no tag set, there was no intent to actually convey semantics in, a, in an interchangeable manner. The idea was that we enabled <laughs> anyone who wanted to put logical structure into PDF to be able to, to add that and then consume it. But the idea was that this would probably be private, that companies would do this for their own use, in their own processing systems. It wasn't really intended to be interchangeable. Um, as such, you could put anything into, tech, into a logically structured PDF and it, you could then reuse it. In PDF 1.4, we finally introduced the concept of tag PDF. And tag PDF, as I say, builds on top of those smart content and logical structure capabilities, but adds extra things. We define a set of semantics, things like headings and paragraphs and lists and tables, um, some more complex uh, uh, concepts. We have articles and parts of documents. Um, we have uh, wire chews and things that I don't know much about. Um, but the idea was that we basically now had a defined set of semantics that could be exchanged. This was built on top of that general mechanism. You could still interchange any type of, of, of document semantics, but we defined a default set that you could map to that allowed you to interchange that with someone else. 
And that at its heart is accessibility, and I'll talk in a bit about how that delivers accessibility. Tech PDF goes a little bit beyond that, though. Um, it talks about how you can take content and map it to Unicode values, so when I do content extraction, I actually get real text that could be consumed by a human, rather than glyph indexes. It allowed us to put alternate text around images and figures so that we can actually describe those things. And it also allowed us to identify which parts of the page were artifact versus real content. And I'll get to some examples of, of what an artifact is compared to real content in, in a later slide. So basically, you can think of type PDF as something that grew based on previous technologies over several releases of the PDF. But by the time it was released in, tech for, in PDF 1.4, the concept for accessibility use was, was ingrained in this, in this uh, technique. PDF UA requires tagged PDF. At its heart, it's just basically saying, thou shall do tagged PDF. Thou shall get the semantics right. You know, if you have a list, it shall be a list. And other people, I think, today are going to talk a bit more about what PDF UA does beyond tagged PDF, so I'm not going to go into too much detail there. But the idea behind PDF UA is it layers on top of this. In principle, ISO 32000 part one could produce fully accessible PDFs. PDF UA adds nothing to 32000. What it does do is it requires things and restricts things to ensure that those are used correctly so that when we do a document in change with PDF UA, it is accessible. It also goes beyond that and talks, and I think uh, Adam mentioned this earlier, it, it goes beyond the file format and talks about how processes work with it, how ET has to interact with it. Um, so it's got more than just the file format, um, but the file format part of it is entirely type PDF. Um, the value of, of semantics in documents is that it enables content access. Basically, without it, you, you really can't get to that content in a meaningful way. And so, type PDF guarantees that the content has, uh, is, is processable by an application, that the nature of each piece of content is understood, and that we have a logical reading order that we can provide to a user. Um, and I think this ties into a question that was asked earlier, but the benefits of this go far beyond accessibility. They allow us to do copy and paste in a meaningful way. It allows me to do text selection. Um, if I want to in my document, because if I follow the logical structure, I can do more intelligent selections. Um, it allows us to do search. So there's a lot more um, than accessibility, but of course accessibility is the main focus of this conference. Um, because of that unambiguous content access, you can now do things with logical reading order, but beyond that you can do higher level things, such as navigation. I can move the document <coughs> by chapter, by heading, potentially navigating complex structures like tables, say for this cell in a table, what's its heading? What's the context of this? Without type PDF, you just you couldn't do that. Um, you can get descriptions for images, I already mentioned. And the concept behind PDF UA was equivalence, the idea that there is a textual equivalent to any content inside the PDF. Now, there's a limitation. We've already talked about video and things like that, and I, I won't go into that here. But this was primarily aimed at PDF native content. Um, Tag PDF is, is the basis of the story. PDF UA completes that story. It's why Tag PDF that is PDF UA compliant is accessible PDF, at least at a content level. It doesn't talk about other issues, and I think maybe Yen is going to talk about some of this later. So, what do I have to do as an author to produce a good type PDF? I've kind of talked about the technical. I apologize to you all for having felt so deep into the technical requirements there, because I'm not sure if it's really the, the, the thing you're interested in, but I, I hope it forms a basis now for what I'm going to talk about. So, I think of the process of creating a good type PDF as this kind of series of steps that you have to, to follow. They're not things that you do in order, just to be clear, they're, they're things you think about in parallel. But these are the sorts of steps you have to go through to try to, to make a PDF count. Um, the first thing is that you have to identify your box of content. Now, ignore the fact that I've, I've done this at a, a code style on the right, or in a content stream. But if you're in a piece of software that's doing this, you have to be able to tell it which content belongs to which logical box. So you have to demarcate and segment your content streams. Now, 
Applications will do this for you. Microsoft Word does a reasonably good job of this. Um, there are some Adobe products that do that I won't bother mentioning. But basically, if you start with a PDF that's inaccessible and you want to transform it into an accessible PDF, you have to segment the content to be able to do that. Um, and so that means marking that content, I talked about the concept of marked content, um, and identifying the artifacts within that content. Um, within each piece of content, the reading order is, is mandatory, basically. Within Type PDF, that you can break up the content streams and potentially put them in different orders to produce different visual effects. But within any block of content within this, it has to be in reading order. Otherwise, there is no deterministic manner in which you can get that content back out. Um, and reading order is logically defined. It's not defined by the content order on the page. It is a good thing if those align, just to be clear, uh, for processing, for simplicity. But they, the logical order is the order of content in the document in a type PDF. Once you've done content segmentation and you talk about artifacts, you have to basically assign content into what's known as the logical content or artifacts. And so I have an example of a document on the right that has several artifacts. Uh, it's got printer marks around the outside, and I think actually I actually have a slide that goes into more detail. But basically, this is the sort of document you would want to mark up using type PDF to disambiguate the content. Um, because it's not reliant on rendering, you don't have to change the visual appearance of the document to meet the requirements of type PDF. Um, and so, let me actually break this, this example down to talk about how artifacts are decided in the document. Um, we have printer marks. Those are not logical content. Logical content is what I, the author of the document, wrote when I created <coughs> that document. Printer marks are an artifact that tell printers how to print that correctly. They're not considered logical content. If I'm reading it to a user who's only interested in consuming that content, I want to ignore that. But there's more than just that. There's a running header here that has an image that's probably taken from the front page. Um, there's the uh, header and footer of the document, in this case the header, that has chapter information, document title. These are artifacts of layout. They're artifacts of typography. When I do good typography, I put these things so that a sighted user can use them as visual cues, but they are not fundamentally part of the content. They're things that should be able to be generated by software, so that if someone's using assistive technology, for example, that they can be generated for them on the fly rather than having to be rendered. And they wouldn't even read in an order. There is no fundamental order to that content. Um, the vertical bar, in this case, that splits the header of the page from the actual body content is also an artifact. Um, the background cells that make up these tables are artifacts. Sighted users use these blocks to, to delineate content, but obviously they have no semantic meaning. They're just there for us as humans to infer that. But if someone can't see them, they have no meaning. So they're artifacts of layout. They're artifacts of typography. They're not fundamentally content. Just drilling down into a page, there's other type of content here that isn't real. In this case, there are a lot of uh, hyphens, soft hyphens. Now, I want to be clear, the soft hyphens is a special technique for actually uh, not putting, which is using the proper Unicode value for a soft hyphen to tell the user that it's not uh, something that was put in by the author, that it was done so that I could lay out this content in a block. Um, if I take the figure that was at the bottom of this, the, the caption is content, but the numberings those types of things are not usually considered content. Again, they're an artifact of the fact that this was the third caption on the, in the document, not the fact that it's the number three is not meaningful necessarily. That said, to refer to someone else, to, to talk about this to someone else, you still need to be able to convey that information. If I go to someone and say, read the third caption in the document, I'll look at the third table. I need that information. I need to be able to get to that. But the actual number that represents it in this table is, is, uh, is an artifact. Um, so, once you've, um, once you've decided what is real content and what is artifact, the next thing to do is build a logical structure for that. Um, a logical structure allows you to define a document's layout. Um, it's got the higher level structures, so documents, parts, articles, sections. Within a section you might have a heading, a paragraph, a list, a figure, a table. Um, 
Once you've got that logical structure, you then have to associate it to the content. So once you've described the structure of the document, you need to point it back into that content. And so I borrowed this from uh, Duff, who very kindly allowed me to steal one of his uh, diagrams. Um, but basically, um, the concept is that you have some text in the document. Because of those requirements I talked about earlier, where you have two columns, and it was common to jump and hop those columns, um, in this case, we've used the logical order in the, in the structure to override the content order, and so that's what you're seeing in this, in this graph. After you structure your know, document, so, so far, we've put Unicode values in, we've, I think we knew we did that. <laughs> we, 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 we marked up the logical content and the artifacts. Uh, we've now put logical structure in. Another thing that's very useful is alternate text descriptive text for images and figures and things like that. They're particularly useful when you have something that would be obvious to a sighted user, but obviously um, would not be so you can't see the image. You can describe the image. Uh, it has to, there's no fundamental rule in type PDF as to what content goes into a description. That's for <coughs> the author to decide what the salient uh, aspects of that, uh, that image are. In this case, I thought it was a photo of a, uh, this bridge in Basel. Um, it might be that uh, someone else has a different perspective on this. Maybe they're interested in some other aspect. Um, and so captions can be applied to tables, figures, and lists to annotate them. I mentioned earlier that type PDF was built on top of logical structure, and the logical structure allowed embedding any type of uh, element into a document. And so it still allows that. If you want to store .book, .daisy, other formats in type PDF, you can do so. And you use a technique called role mapping to map those tags from their, their, their custom syntax to our predefined set of tags. And so the role map is how you do that. You basically say all annotations should be read as spans. And, and so the example on the right is just a list of things mapped from a complex type set into the standard types that are defined in ISO 32000. I talked earlier about language. Another thing that type PDF enables is the, is the identification of language. There are three levels of identification of language. One is for the whole document. You can say this entire document is in English or French or German. You can, for specific structural nodes in the content, say that this specific paragraph, for example, is in German, even though the rest of the document is in English. Um, you can even go down to the, the fundamental page content and describe a language. So when you're building a type PDF, you have three ways and three levels to mark up the language of the document, and it allows you to easily identify content within the documents in some other language from the primary. It allows you to have mixed language documents where the, the two are English and French and alternate in them. I'm thinking Canadian, for example, Adam. <laughs> and so um, the language is important, particularly for read aloud. It enables pronunciation. Um, it, it, it's fundamental to, to good accessibility. <coughs> and actually, I, I meant to mention this earlier, but um, the other thing is because uh, PDF just basically is rendering, um, it uses glyph indexes to call out font characters and to put them on the page. Those don't have to correspond with any known uh, uh, layout. They don't have to correspond to ASCII or UTF-8 or any of those standards. And so, in old PDFs, it's quite hard to pull that content out in a meaningful fashion. Um, I, I show a very simple example on the right where the rendering of this A, B, C, C, D, space E, D, F, C, G is actually Hello World. And if you look at my mapping, you'll see how that gets from that to the other. Um, basically, there are a couple of mechanisms for identifying content. You can use a known encoding like WinAnsley, Mac Roman, or you can put in this Unicode map that tells you that this glyph index maps to this Unicode value, and that then enables you to get access to that content. So when you extract it, for example, PDF into Notepad, you can actually get that text in a meaningful manner, where you're guaranteed that it matches what the visual user would see when looking at that glyph rendered on the, on the canvas. So, for a lot of documents, this information has to come from somewhere. You can pay for a very complex process where someone goes through and does all this work for you. That's, that's definitely one option. But the good news is that documents, there are some formats that try to generate type PDF, and they do it using information available in the software. In Microsoft Word, it knows 
what, what language you're writing in, or at least supposedly you tell it what language your document's in. It has a mechanism for identifying other languages within the same document. Um, I mentioned the <coughs> product game design there, but there's lots of tools that produce tagged PDF. And they basically use that source document, which has semantics, or has some level of semantics, to, to, to move to tagged PDF. I want to be clear that it's unlikely that that simple conversion would be PDF UA compliance, that there's extra checks and steps that have to go into it. Authors need to make sure that they go in and put captions in correctly. But good software can produce accessible PDF if used well. Um, you do the best you can when you're trying to be accurate with this stuff. And hopefully these tools will get better over time and produce better, more accessible type PDF. Uh, as those tools provide interfaces to allow authors to actually store that information. If PDF UA becomes a standard, if it's not a standard, adopted <coughs> by governments as standards, just to be clear, um, hopefully software will have to step up and actually put this information into the authoring tools. And then the authoring tools generate that PDF. It's much easier to get tagged PDF out of those systems. <coughs> um, a lot of documents, though, aren't produced digitally first. We scan in documents that we receive. We have massive amounts of historical documents that exist pre-typography even. Um, PDF does enable accessibility for those types of documents. Um, by pulling in that textual content into a document, there are techniques to store the text invisibly under the content and tag it such that you can now access the content even though the appearance might be a manuscript. Or in this case, I've just scanned in a document that happened to, to be sent to me as a, as a printout. Um, so, there are some complicated things around OCR. For example, you might have an OCR document that has a mix of images and text, and so processing software has to <coughs> split that up and break it up so that the figures can be separated from the body text. Um, you have to add alt text to your images and things like that. <laughs> but fundamentally, even an image-based PDF can be accessible if the right techniques are applied to it. Um, but I think there are still some outstanding challenges. I think Adam pointed out that it's not a trivial world to make PDF accessible. Um, document interchange, interchange is still a difficulty. Even though we have standard tags, getting users to use them consistently has been a challenge. We'll see different uses of those tags depending on two people authoring the same document. Um, we have to see assistive technology adapt and adopt the, uh, the techniques that we describe so that they actually benefit from this data. If they, as described earlier, there's three parts to this. If, if only the tagging is there, if only the PDF is changed, it doesn't help if the AT doesn't recognize that. So we require all three, syntax, processing uh, software, and AT, to conform to PDF UA to meet accessibility. Um, we need those authoring tools to start producing reliable type PDF if you want to see a real uh, adoption in the market. Um, there are still some challenges around tagging complex structures like math, chemistry, musical notation. Um, hopefully we're addressing those in PDF 2.0, but uh, that, that's not in the market yet. Um, we are investigating this and uh, we've, we've come up with some solutions for the future, but as a PDF <coughs> part one, they don't exist. Um, PDF is complex in that it represents many classes of document. Um, there's business documents, there's journals, there's your parking ticket, bank statements. These things all have very, <coughs> very, very different representations, and yet we've tried to provide one set of standard tags to represent all these documents. Obviously, it's quite simple. Uh, we couldn't represent the entire ontology of documents in the world. And so there are some challenges, as I say, around consistent semantics and representing these documents. And it requires just good common sense practices and um, information exchange to get good practices around producing these types of documents. Um, you know, there's some things about consistency about how you structure the higher levels of a document you have to think about, uh, particularly about articles, parts, and sections. In ISO 32000 Part 1 and PDF UA Part 1, these things can be somewhat ambiguous. I think OLAF is going to talk about PDF 2.0 and PDF UA Part 2, and hopefully we'll talk about some of the things we'll be looking at to address these issues. Um, what I mean by mapping here is that once an author has chosen some technique to represent their content, 
it sometimes fails to convey the semantics they intended. And so you've got some hard choices sometimes around what to use in the what circumstances. PDF UA does a good job of addressing that. This is a type of PDF concern. Um, but making sure you have appropriate semantics is important. Um, and as I say, assistive technology really has to improve around PDF processing to really benefit from all these techniques. Um, so just to wrap up and summarize, you know, I think technicalities of type PDF are well understood and well defined. Um, but the practicalities of producing type documents haven't quite caught up yet. It's still hard to produce good type PDF out of just Word or Google Docs or LaTeX or some, some processing software. Um, however, even doing part of this gives benefits. While I think anyone in this room would agree that PDF UA is the gold standard for which we should all strive, getting good tech PDF in the first place, it, it gives you a large benefit. And the more people put effort into processing and generating good tech PDF, the closer we'll get to good PDF UA. Um, and so we've still got some way to go in terms of the generating software around PDF UA, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a path we need to go down if PDF is going to be um, accepted as accessible. Okay, that's my, that's my talk. Side approve again. Though I understand that this uh, today was not going to be commercial, I will nonetheless ask you a question concerning tools. Uh, because if we, if we take the public sector here in Denmark, it's almost completely dominated by uh, Microsoft Office uh, uh, programs. What would you rec recommend as, as the best tools for producing tag PDF from them? Would it be the Office products themselves, or would it be a post processing tool, Acrobat, or what would it be the best two tools for? for making tags PDF from uh, Office? That's a, that's a great question. And, and I, it's not what I can truly answer, unfortunately, because I think there are a lot of vendors who produce great tools that can produce great output. And I wouldn't say one piece of software is the right way to do it. Microsoft Word itself has significantly improved in producing tag PDF over the years. And the new Office 2016 actually does a really good job of producing tag PDF under certain circumstances. We all know that you can use Microsoft Word in a really bad way, um, and you can basically go and you know, make change font sizes in line, you can change to italics and bold, you can do subscriptions, you, you can do anything you want to make it appear a certain way. If you do that in a, a very ad hoc sort of manner, there's no software that's going to do a good job of converting that to good time PDF. If you use styles, and you semantically describe things, and you try to, to, to follow good practices, you're much more likely to get a good document out of that. So, uh, there may be some vendors here today who can you know, volunteer the, the best techniques for this. Um, I think Adobe somewhere does a good job, but I don't think it's the only one by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and as I say, I think even Microsoft Word has, has significantly improved its own ability to generate tag PDF. And I believe these days, I, I may be mistaken on this, uh, please tell me if I'm wrong, but I think the latest version of our Office produces tag PDF by default when you create PDF. It used to be an option that you had to turn on and enable. Um, and I know several vendors have switched to make it the default now. So at least we're going to see more type PDF. The quality of that type PDF, though, is still, still the question. I'm sorry that I wasn't able to fully answer your question. And just to follow up with that, there will be more demonstrations tomorrow by tools to create accessible PDFs. Questions for Brian? Uh, Peter from the uh, HC of the uh, I was wondering, could it be uh, a practical uh, with the if you with Microsoft perhaps or, or other Windows makes templates that would be better for converting to tag PDF? I think that's an interesting <coughs> question. I think template-driven approaches, uh, rule-based approaches, definitely help. Um, I think if you take a simple document in Microsoft Word and you use the styles in a semantic manner, 
You, uh, you demarcate your headings correctly, your paragraphs, you mark tables as tables, you, you know, mark the headings as headings rather than just going through and manually emboldening each uh, heading. Even that will, will have a, a, a significant benefit when producing tag PDF. Uh, uh, definitely, I mean, documents that are being produced through some engine where the content is kind of divorced from the, uh, the style often help. And I think it's one of the strengths of PDF as a format that it does divorce layout from logical content. There are many strengths to HTML, and I, I don't want to get into a HTML versus PDF sort of discussion, but um, one of the powers of PDF, one of the advantages of this technique is that you do not <coughs> have to change your visual appearance in any way to form any arbitrary logical structure to type PDF. And, and that's very powerful, because um, in other languages, you often have to change your tagging to produce style. And that's true in Word and, and sorry. Yeah, but, uh, for instance, I've seen uh, a lot of uh, municipalities <coughs> uh, and the uh, government thinks about this uh, having letters where they put the uh, address or major information about uh, who they are in the, in the headers and then the place headers, different places on, on the on letter. And letter or, or headings and stuff like that uh, are artifacts when you convert them. So, so headings at the point of view. Not, not headings, but but but. Uh, yeah, yeah, page headers. Yeah. 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 So yeah. definitely, page headers and footers are generally considered artifacts. Um, although that's not necessarily a rule. I think PDF UA does require that. But if you have labels for content, for example, you have uh, an address and you say name, uh, street, city, uh, country, those things can be. Uh, associated directly with uh, the fields, so that you can start to get semantic uh, information. And some of that will come at a, a, a there's some level that's in the logical structure, and there's some that by associating this open-ended descriptive field with where you enter the data, you, you, you associate that semantics uh, at a different level. More questions? Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.